Welcome back to Couch Talk, everybody. Excuse my dog rudely eating his bowl while I'm trying to do this review. Uh, today, we're here to review Mamma Mia, Here We Go Again. The sequel to the hit classic directed by Felita Lloyd, I believe, which was adapted from the play that was released in um, 1999. However, she is not returning to direct the sequel. This one is by Ol Parker, who is no stranger to love stories, for he's also done Imagine Me and You and Now is Good, I believe, which I haven't seen both of them, but I know they're both romantic comedies, so he's no stranger to the whole love story that goes on in this movie. Uh, this movie brings back all of the original cast, you know, Amanda Seyfried as Sophie, and Dominic Cooper as Skye, Stellan Skarsgård as Bill, Colin Firth as Harry, Pierce Brosnan as Sam, Meryl Streep as Donna, Christine Barzniski as Tanya, and Julie Walters as Rosie. Sorry for the quick cuts, but it's a lot of people for me to get in there and having some trouble remembering all of their names. Uh, there's also some newcomers. Now, before I get into that, this movie is essentially five years after the events of the first movie. Uh, Amanda Seyfried's character, Sophie, is trying to uh, host a grand opening for the hotel that her mother was trying to, you know, rebuild from before uh, Sophie was even a thing. You know, she, she's she's finally, you know, old enough and she she's here to do this grand opening and she has everything ready, you know, she has all the decorations and everything. Um, she has a bunch of food getting ready, she has a bunch of famous people coming to, you know, like, talk about this place and uh, she has a bunch of, like, news reporters coming and hopefully make, make, like, good articles about it so that it gets known because she wants to bring money to this place. It's a beautiful place and not a whole lot of people go there, especially tourist-wise, so she's trying to make it more grand for the world to see. However, a storm comes in and kind of ruins everything, and she has one night to, like, get everything back together, you know, with the help of her family, and slowly over the course of the movie, you know, she starts learning about how each one of her three stepfathers met her mom, and thus, you have Mamma Mia 2, here we go again, cue the happy music. I did read that this time, however, the writer and director chose the songs and then made the movie around it, as opposed to in the first movie, apparently, they made the movie first and then tried to pick songs that fit around it. And um, I'll say this, through and through, my favorite song of both these movies is still Dancing Queen, man. It's just It just has such like a lively, good vibe to it. Now, don't get me wrong. This movie doesn't do anything to change musicals or change the game or bring anything new. But if you love the first one, it delivers. You know, it's, it, like I said, it's nothing new, but it gives you exactly what you would want out of a Mamma Mia 2 sequel. Now, I'm not gonna go into spoilers here because I think everyone that liked the first one should see this movie, but um, half of this movie is Amanda Seyfried's character trying to get this day ready and learning about her mom but the other half of the movie, the big chunk of the movie, is actually about Donna, you know, Sophie's mom, uh, when she was very young. And it's about how she got to this island and how she met these three men and how she grew feelings for them and why she winded up with Sam. And um, Sam, uh, Pierce Bronson's character, is played by Jeremy Ivan, who was also in uh, Steven Spielberg's War Horse, which was a fantastic movie. The other two characters, um, they're not really too popular. I'm not too familiar with what else they've done. Um, the guy that plays Bill is Josh Dillon, and the guy that plays Harry is Hugh Skinner. Uh, they all do fine. They all do fine. I don't. Th I think Harry's backstory was the weakest out of the link. Um, Bill's was better, and Sam's is the best, but I think it's fitting because um, Donna winds up with Sam anyway. Uh, they all have their own moments to shine, and the reason why... I, I think I like this movie a little bit better than the first is because I'm a sucker for rom-coms and I love musicals, but instead of getting just one love story like you got in the first one, you got three. And it was kind of nice to just see all these three different takes of people that fell in love with Donna and why they fell in love with her and why she was such a wonderful person. And I really liked seeing her go to the island for the first time and how she found this hotel and how it was all broken down. And it was like really the start of a journey that was so grounded in the first one, and it was a really nice breath of fresh air. The music was great you know, this time around. I really liked the songs that they picked. Uh, there's that one song, Super Trooper, that like they do a couple times over and over in the movie, and it was just, it works so well. And uh, Cher makes a cameo in it, if you've seen the trailer. She's fantastic, and she has the voice of an angel. Um, but the real standout here 
is Lily James, who plays young Donna. Um, Meryl Streep was fantastic in the first one, but I honestly think Lily James is far better. Her voice just has this beauty to it. I don't know. She just sounds like way better for singing than Meryl Streep. No offense to her because she was a good singer, but Lily James is just so good, and she just really encompasses this character, and every time she's on screen, like, it's just... It almost feels like a fairy tale is unfolding, and she's like a princess in like some fairy tale movie. I don't really know how to explain it, but if you see the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about. She just she is the real star of this movie. As much as Amanda Seyfried gets half the screen time, you're going to see this movie for you know young Donna, and she does not disappoint. I'm really excited to see what she does next after this because she's a star. She should be in the A Star Is Born movie with Bradley Cooper, but. We got Lady Gaga instead. No big deal. And, you know, aside from that, everyone else is very, very secondary characters. You know, the two friends are back, and we get to see younger versions of themselves. Um, you know, Dominic Cooper, uh, her boyfriend in the first one, is back in this one. And he gets a little bit more to do and a little bit more range of acting other than, like, surfer or, like, hipster like, he, he's a lot more serious now, and there's actually, like, a nice arc between him and Amanda Seyfried's character. Uh, creates some tension there. He gets a little bit more to do in this one. Uh, I think he's still very underutilized. I think he's a fantastic actor. If any of you have been following on Preacher, it's, like, one of the best shows on AMC and one of the best shows, period. Uh, he's just such a good actor, and he gets this small part in this movie, which isn't his fault, you know, or the writer's fault, really, because... The movie's not about him. This movie, at its heart, is about Donna. So they couldn't really give him that much to do. But when he is in it, it's really enjoyable. And there's a part towards the last half of the movie that he comes, and it's one of my favorite parts. It has to do with the Dancing Queen song. You know what I'm talking about if you've seen it. And aside from that, the only real gripe I had with it was that um, the guy that plays Bill, he just didn't really seem like he wanted to be there. Like Almost like one of those situations where he's like contractually obligated to be there. But... He's not, it's not like he's like playing the role like Spider-Man where he has to be in three movies. Like, I feel like he did it for the paycheck almost. Like, it just didn't really seem to me like he was acting all that much. And I don't know, like every time he was on screen, it just, like he was so much better in the first one. Maybe, maybe just because he's older now, I'm just looking at it the wrong way, but it, it, there's just something about his character that didn't sit right with me. And the other gripe is, this is a minor spoiler. So be warned, if you haven't seen the first one, which I don't know why you'd be watching this one if you haven't seen the first one, but if you haven't seen the first one, then just stop watching it now and skip forward to like the last 15 seconds where I rate the movie. Um, but you've been warned, so uh, it's proven, it's now known that Harry's character is either gay or bisexual. I'm not too sure. Uh, it's never clarified what he is. All you know is that Donna was his last female love. Uh, I think he sh she was actually his last anything. I'm pretty sure he only had like dogs after that. But there are like little moments that uh, shimmer through of like him being attracted to men, like the stares he gives them, the stares they give him. And uh, I thought this movie would do a much better job of bringing that to light more and giving him like a nice like arc in that category. Or maybe he had like a boyfriend or maybe he meets somebody on the island because this island is supposed to be like, not literally magical, but like, you know, you find yourself there and like, that just doesn't happen for him, and it was kind of upsetting. And then um, the movie ends, and they never touch upon it at all, which is like upsetting to me, at least. Because me and my girlfriend, we were sitting in the theater, and I kept thinking to myself, like, you know, the last movie ended off with him pretty much kind of coming out of the closet. And then, I don't know, I just it's just weird to me that they like set that up, and then they went to the sequel, and they didn't touch upon it at all. And then I learned that if you stay into the after credits scene, this is really funny ongoing bit with like this uh, ticket guy that like sells you the tickets to get on the ferry. And every time someone comes up to him before he stamps the ticket, he like looks at their passport and you know tells them their flaws, like oh you look better in this picture than you do now or this and that. And um, apparently in the end credit scene, I didn't say to see it because I mean this isn't a Marvel movie and I didn't think that this would have this, but. Um, he sings the song Take a Chance on Me to Harry to try and like win him over as a lover and they cut that out and put it in the end credit scene. That should have been an actual movie. That would have been a fantastic uh, moment for Harry and it would have like touched upon like, you know, the conclusion that he had in the last movie, but 
they put it towards the end credits, which is kind of a sh it's kind of upsetting because most people don't stay to after credit scenes, especially if it's not even part of a Marvel movie. So it's kind of like they nervously threw it in there. They didn't know if it would work in the movie, and they should have put it in there because from what I'm told from people that have seen it, it was really good. Said so that those were my only gripes from the movie. Uh, I'm gonna give this movie an eight. I think it's a worthy successor. Uh, I think I like parts about this movie more, like especially the story, but I think the first movie was a little bit more well made and a little bit more well choreographed. The dancing was a lot better. And it also seemed like everyone in the first movie was pouring their heart out more into the role. Like they thought it was like a one and done. So they were really giving it their all. And now they're back for the sequel and they're only at like 80% instead of like 110%. But aside from that, let me know what you guys think in the comments down below. Did you like the movie? Do you want to see Mamma Mia 3? If this one does good, they might close it out. I believe they said that the title would be called Mamma Mia, Thank You for the Music. I mean, I could always go for some more album music. But my question is, can you guys? Anyway, catch you next time on Couch Talk.